How We Let Go. Created by Rebecca Fox and Anthony Magnabosco. I was like a deep sea diver, slowly rising to the surface and stopping to decompress at regular intervals. Letting go of my spiritual beliefs was disorienting, exhilarating, and often lonely. If you're an ex-believer, I want to know, how was it for you? Please fill out my survey and I'll make art from all of our experiences. That's the tweet I sent in late December 2018. The survey was 36 questions about the process of letting go of faith beliefs. Deep questions, personal questions, philosophical questions, you know, the kind of questions that hurt. I wanted to know what people in the atheist, humanist, skeptical community, my community, went through when they left their religion or spiritual path. I wanted to find out in what ways we were similar, in what ways the process we'd gone through alone had brought us together. We often talk about or bitch about where we came from, and we often celebrate where we are now, but I wanted to know how we got here. Over the shortest days and longest nights, the responses rolled in. They were moving, honest, and often darkly humorous. People contacted me to let me know that my questions had made them cry, and I told them their answers were bringing me to tears too. I thought answering the questions was a big ask. The survey took up to 30 minutes to complete, but people told me it helped that they wanted to talk. Maybe we don't talk about this, the hard bit, the letting go, enough. When I closed the survey, I had 850 responses, not just ticked boxes and data, but hundreds of comments under each question in which people had shared their thoughts and feelings. So I'm going to release the data and my analysis. Maybe it will spark some other projects. But here, I'm just gonna give an overview of some of the results that I found most surprising or interesting. My respondents were mainly male, between 25 and 60 years old, and American. 44 countries were represented in the data, with the top five being the US, Canada, the UK, Poland, and Australia. On this map, the darker the shade of green, the more people came from that country. So, as you might expect with that demographic, the majority of my respondents were former Christians. I asked, what, if any, religion were you raised in? As you can see, 88.2% of my respondents were former Christians, but almost all religions were represented, at least all the religions I've ever heard of, and a few I had to Google. Within the former Christian majority, there were a diversity of denominations. The largest minority were ex-Catholics, with the majority simply describing themselves as raised Christian. In the religious background section of the survey, I asked, have you ever had an experience that at the time you characterized as spiritual, mystical or supernatural. Maybe it says something about my circle of friends that the 43.6% who said no surprised me. I thought everyone had seen, or at least thought they'd seen, one ghost. In the comments under this question, the other 56.4% told me about their experiences. The most common seemingly supernatural events people reported were ghosts, sleep paralysis, and experiencing the presence of God. The first two are no surprise. Ghosts are a deeply ingrained cultural tradition. In my country, polls indicate that one in three people believe in them. Ghosts are used to explain anything from strange light artifacts in photos, to figures looming in our peripheral vision, to a general sense of being watched. And the second most commonly mentioned experience, sleep paralysis, you know, that strange parasomnia where you wake up before your body does, and the fear and disorientation that inspires scary dreamlike hallucinations, that's thought to affect around 40% of the population. But experiencing the presence of God is interesting, especially for atheists. Religious people often use these experiences to explain or justify their faith, but it seems many ex-believers have had them too. Here are two of my respondents describing their experiences. After hours of fasting and prayer, I heard a voice that I believed at the time was God. I also used to feel a full body tingling during meditation and prayer. I could walk around for hours feeling that tingling, feeling as though my awareness to my surroundings was heightened. The full body tingling happened more than a hundred times in my life. I still don't have an answer for it. 
a pastor prayed over me to receive the indwelling of the Spirit, I felt a warmth begin in my belly that radiated upward and out of my mouth. It's the only truly supernatural, or at least unexplained, event in my life. I'm not sure exactly what's going on in our brains when this happens, but similar experiences of being overwhelmed by awe and wonder with accompanying physical sensations are reported from many different cultures and religions. Perhaps it's a state of euphoria caused by a rush of adrenaline and endorphins. Primatologist Jane Goodall believes she's witnessed chimpanzees experiencing similar states while staring at waterfalls. Whatever it is, it's glorious. I hope we can find some ways to invoke it in our secular lives. If you've got a surefire method, let me know in the comments below. I wanted to know what provoked people to begin questioning their faith beliefs. I was expecting people to say they noticed inconsistencies in their holy books or couldn't stomach the regressive attitude of their fellow believers. I asked, was there a particular big question or problem with your beliefs that troubled you first? The answers I expected were common, but in the comments beneath this question, I found my fellow philosophy nerds. The problem of evil came up a lot. The problem of evil is a classic philosophical problem. It was first raised in ancient Greece, hundreds of years before the Christian God was conceived. If God is all knowing, all loving and all powerful, in the words of Stephen Fry, bone cancer in children. What's that about? People reported personal tragedies and world events that prompted them to ask this question. 9-11 was mentioned several times. But for some, like Teresa, it was a small thing that made them start asking big questions. The kid next door shot a hummingbird in our yard with a BB gun. I remember holding the bird as the life drained out of it, blood coating its jeweled feathers. I prayed so hard for this little bird to be saved. That's when the seed of doubt was planted. I wanted to get an idea of what people feared would happen if they let go of their beliefs, and if those fears were justified. So I asked, what did you imagine the worst case scenario might be if you let go of your faith beliefs? The main fear was of social ostracism, either by losing connection with close family or being shunned by an entire community. This is unsurprising. The threat of expulsion or tack fear or disfellowshipping, I learned many new horrible words in the comments below this question, is incredibly powerful. Our evolutionary ancestors who were banished from their tribe were in mortal danger. Many religions use this primal fear to ensure loyalty. But in a later question, only 8.8% .8 of my respondents reported being rejected by people close to them as a result of letting go of their beliefs. That seems hopeful, but it may be at least partly explained by the fact that those who accurately perceive themselves to be at high risk of ostracism are less likely to come out as atheists, and who can blame them? I was brought up in a secular household. My unconventional faith beliefs were at least partly self-inflicted and I never flirted with any of the religions of the book, which is probably why it didn't occur to me to put hell on my list of feared worst case scenarios. But when I scrolled through the comments, I read that word again and again. My worst case scenario, that I was wrong, God was real, and I was going to hell. That I would burn for all eternity in a lake of fire, tormented by demons. Eternal damnation. It still seems strange to me, people doubting their faith beliefs, but terrified of pursuing those doubts for fear of imprisonment in a place they're beginning to suspect is imaginary. Better keep believing in hell, or I'll go to hell? Reading these comments made me angry on behalf of the people who had to face this awful fear and deeply impressed by their perseverance. It also made my heart ache for those currently wrestling with it in the process of letting go. I asked, which areas of your life were affected by disregarding your beliefs? This graph shows that people feel the positives significantly outweigh the negatives. The reported improvements to emotional well-being are particularly dramatic. 
It also shows that the negative effects of letting go are felt most of all in people's relationships with their family, friends and community. Which I think suggests we need to focus on supporting people experiencing relationship difficulties and make sure the secular community is an accepting, welcoming, friendly place. Those people still in the middle of their doubts might be encouraged to know that when I asked, do you think you're better off or worse off without your faith beliefs, almost 95% consider themselves much better off or somewhat better off. Not a single respondent thought they were much worse off. In the comments, people describe getting the chance to meet and marry the person they love, travel the world, live without guilt or fear, and try caffeine for the first time as just some of the benefits. The last question in the survey was the first one I thought of. I wanted to find a way to reach out to people currently in the process of letting go. Really, I wanted to reach back to myself when I was there and offer to hold her hand. So I gave my respondents the opportunity to do the same. I asked, what do you wish someone had told you when you were in the midst of reevaluating your beliefs? These were the most moving and insightful answers of the whole survey. And since I have hundreds, I'll curate them into a Twitter feed of notes to our past selves and to those still struggling with their doubts. Follow at How We Let Go to read these messages. I've taken some of them, rearranged but unedited, to create this poem which I hope reaches someone who needs it. It's okay to question. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to explore the doubts. It's okay to question authority. It's okay to question your beliefs. It's okay to question everything. It's okay to explore your thoughts on religion. It's okay to step off the religious bandwagon for a while. It's okay to seek answers. It's okay to require proof. It's okay to view the world differently. It's okay to think differently. It's okay to think for yourself. It's okay to trust yourself. It's okay to change your mind. It's okay to be an atheist. It's okay to be gay. It's okay to let go. It's okay to leave. It's okay not to know. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to not believe in anything. It's okay. You'll be okay. If you've already come out the other side and want to help someone going through the process of letting go, you can support or promote organizations like Recovering From Religion or the Ex-Muslims of North America. If you want to find out more about the results of this survey and read my analysis and recommendations for the atheist community, you can find my full report here. Or just look at the raw data, like a nerd. If you want to hear me discuss these results and what they mean for atheist advocacy with Anthony Magnabosco, my partner on this project, please check out this podcast. On Twitter, please follow at How We Let Go to read my respondents' messages to their past selves and follow at Magna Bosco and at Rebecca on Paper to keep up with Anthony and me. Thank you to everyone who filled out my survey, particularly to those who are brave enough to share their personal experiences and those I've quoted in this video. I hope finding out how we got here will help all of us become better advocates, better friends to each other, and better able to cope with the difficulties of letting go. This survey has offered me a chance to get to know atheists, humanists, and skeptics from all over the world. When I think about our movement, it doesn't seem abstract anymore. I feel like I know you guys, and in getting to know you, I've learned a lot about myself. I'm glad we're all in this together. I was like a deep sea diver, slowly rising to the surface and stopping to decompress at regular intervals. I recall at one specific point being rather surprised to discover that I no longer believed. 
I had not expected that. It was like I'd broken surface and discovered a whole new world. Out here, you can breathe. 